Chapter Five of Conan Beyond the Black River by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five The Children of Jebal Sog. Which way is the river? Balthus was confused. We don't dare try for the river now, grunted Conan. The woods between the village and the river are swarming with warriors. Come on. We'll head in the last direction they'll expect us to go, west. Looking back as they entered the thick growth, Balthus beheld the wall dotted with black heads as the savages peered over. The Picts were bewildered. They had not gained the wall in time to see the fugitives take cover. They had rushed to the wall expecting to repel an attack in force. They had seen the body of the dead warrior, but no enemy was in sight. Balthus realized that they did not yet know their prisoner had escaped. From other sounds he believed that the warriors, directed by the shrill voice of Zogar Sag, were destroying the wounded serpent with arrows. The monster was out of the shaman's control. A moment later the quality of the yells was altered. Screeches of rage rose in the night. Conan laughed grimly. He was leading Balthus along a narrow trail that ran west under the black branches, stepping as swiftly and surely as if he trod a well-lighted thoroughfare. Balthus stumbled after him, guiding himself by feeling the dense wall on either hand. "'They'll be after us now. Zogar's discovered you're gone, and he knows my head wasn't in the pile before the altar hut. The dog!' If I'd had another spear, I'd have thrown it through him before I struck the snake. Keep to the trail. They can't track us by torchlight, and there are scores of paths leading from the village. They'll follow those leading to the river first, throw a cordon of warriors from miles along the bank, expecting us to try to break through. We won't take to the woods until we have to. We can make better time on this trail. Now buckle down to it and run as you never ran before. They got over their panic cursed quick, panted Balthus, complying with a fresh burst of speed. They're not afraid of anything very long, grunted Conan. For a space nothing was said between them. The fugitives devoted all their attention to covering distance. They were plunging deeper and deeper into the wilderness, and getting further away from civilization at every step. But Balthus did not question Conan's wisdom. The Cimmerian presently took time to grunt. When we're far enough away from the village, we'll swing back to the river in a big circle. No other village within miles of Guawila. All the picks are gathered in that vicinity. We'll circle wide around them. They can't track us until daylight. They'll pick up our path then, but before dawn we'll leave the trail and take to the woods. They plunged on. The yells died out behind them. Balthus's breath was whistling through his teeth. He felt a pain in his side, and running became torture. He blundered against bushes on each side of the trail. Conan pulled up suddenly, turned, and stared back down the dim path. Somewhere the moon was rising— a dim white glow amid a tangle of branches. "'Shall we take to the woods?' panted Balthus. "'Give me your axe,' murmured Conan softly. "'Something is close behind us.' "'Then we'd better leave the trail,' exclaimed Balthus. Conan shook his head and drew his companion into a dense thicket. The moon rose higher, making a dim light in the path. "'We can't fight the whole tribe.' whispered Balthus. No human being could have found our trail so quickly, or followed us so swiftly, muttered Conan. Keep silent. There followed a tense silence in which Balthus felt that his heart could be heard pounding for miles away. Then, abruptly, without a sound to announce its coming, a savage head appeared in the dim path. Balthus's heart jumped into his throat. At first glance he feared to look upon the awful head of the saber-tooth. But this head was smaller, more narrow. It was a leopard which stood there, snarling silently and glaring down the trail. 
What wind there was was blowing toward the hiding men, concealing their scent. The beast lowered his head and snuffled the trail, then moved forward uncertainly. A chill played down Balthus' spine. The brute was undoubtedly trailing them. And it was suspicious. It lifted its head, its eyes glowing like balls of fire, and growled low in his throat. And at that instant Conan hurled the axe. All the weight of arm and shoulder was behind the throw, and the axe was a streak of silver in the dim moon. Almost before he realized what had happened, Balthus saw the leopard rolling on the ground in its death throes, the handle of the axe standing up from its head. The head of the weapon had split its narrow skull. Conan bounded from the bushes, wrenched his axe free, and dragged the limp body in among the trees, concealing it from the casual glance. "'Now let's go, and go fast,' he grunted, leading the way southward, away from the trail. "'There'll be warriors coming after that cat. As soon as he got his wits back, Zogar sent him after us. The Picts would follow him, and he'd leave them far behind.' He'd circle the village until he hit our trail, then come after us like a streak. They couldn't keep up with him, but they'll have an idea as to our general direction. They'd follow, listening for his cry. Well, they won't hear that, but they'll find the blood on the trail and look around and find the body in the brush. They'll pick up our spoor here if they can. Walk with care. He avoided clinging briars and low-hanging branches effortlessly, gliding between trees without touching the stems, and always planting his feet in the places calculated to show least evidence of his passing. But with Balthus it was slower, more laborious work. No sound came from behind them. They had covered more than a mile when Balthus said, Does Sogar Sag catch leopard cubs and train them for bloodhounds? Conan shook his head. That was a leopard he called out of the woods. But, Balthus persisted, if he can order the beasts to do his bidding, why doesn't he rouse them all and have them after us? The forest is full of leopards. Why send only one after us? Conan did not reply for a space, and when he did it was with a curious reticence. He can't command all the animals, only such as remember Jabal Sog. Jabal Sog, Balthus repeated the ancient name hesitantly. He had never heard it spoken more than three or four times in his whole life. Once all living creatures worshipped him. That was long ago, when beasts and men spoke one language. Men have forgotten him. Even the beasts forget. Only a few remember. The men who remember Jabal Sag and the beasts who remember are brothers and speak the same tongue. Balthus did not reply. He had strained at a Pictish stake and seen the nighted jungle give up its fanged horrors at a shaman's call. Civilized men laugh, said Conan, but not one can tell me how Zogar Sag can call pythons and tigers and leopards out of the wilderness and make them do his bidding. They would say it is a lie if they dared. That's the way with civilized men. When they can't explain something by their half-baked science, they refuse to believe it. The people on the Tauran were closer to the primitive than most Aquilonians. Superstitions persisted whose sources were lost in antiquity, and Balthus had seen that which still prickled his flesh. He could not refute the monstrous thing which Conan's words implied. "'I've heard that there's an ancient grove sacred to Jabal Sag somewhere in this forest,' said Conan. "'I don't know. I've never seen it. But more beasts remember in this country than any I've ever seen.' Then others will be on our trail. They are now, was Conan's disquieting answer. Zogar would never leave our tracking to one beast alone. What are we to do, then? asked Balthus uneasily, grasping his axe as he stared at the gloomy arches above him. 
His flesh crawled with the momentary expectation of ripping talons and fangs leaping from the shadows. Wait. Conan turned, squatted, and with his knife began scratching a curious symbol in the mold. Stooping to look at it over his shoulder, Balthus felt a crawling of flesh along his spine he knew not why. He felt no wind against his face, but there was a rustling of leaves above them, and a weird moaning swept ghostily through the branches. Conan glanced up inscrutably, then rose and stood staring somberly down at the symbol he had drawn. "'What is it?' whispered Balthus. It looked archaic and meaningless to him. He supposed that it was his ignorance of artistry which prevented his identifying it as one of the conventional designs of some prevailing culture. But had he been the most erudite artist in the world, he would have been no nearer the solution. I saw it carved in the rock of a cave no human had visited for a million years, muttered Conan in the uninhabited mountains beyond the sea of Vilayet, half a world away from this spot. Later I saw a black witch-finder of Kush scratch it in the sand of a nameless river. He told me part of its meaning, it's sacred to Jabal Sag, and the creatures which worship him. Watch. They drew back among the dense foliage some yards away, and waited in tense silence. To the east drums muttered, and somewhere to north and west other drums answered. Balthus shivered, though he knew long miles of black forest separated him from the grim beaters of those drums, whose dull pulsing was a sinister overture that set the dark stage for bloody drama. Balthus found himself holding his breath. Then, with a slight shaking of the leaves, the bushes parted and a magnificent panther came into view. The moonlight, dappling through the leaves, shone on its glossy coat, rippling with the play of the great muscles beneath it. With its head held low, it glided toward them. It was smelling out their trail. Then it halted, as if frozen, its muzzle almost touching the symbol cut in the mold. For a long space it crouched, motionless, it flattened its long body and laid its head on the ground before the mark. And Balthus felt the short hair stir on his scalp, for the attitude of the great carnivore was one of awe and adoration. Then the panther rose and backed away carefully, belly almost to the ground. With his hind quarters among the bushes, he wheeled as if in sudden panic, and was gone like a flash of dappled light. Balthus mopped his brow with a trembling hand and glanced at Conan. The barbarian's eyes were smoldering with fires that never lit the eyes of men bred to the ideas of civilization. In that instant he was all wild and had forgotten the man at his side. In his burning gaze Balthus glimpsed and vaguely recognized pristine images and half-embodied memories shadows from life's dawn, forgotten and repudiated by sophisticated races, ancient primeval phantasms, unnamed and nameless. Then the deeper fires were massed, and Conan was silently leading the way deeper into the forest. "'We've no more to fear from the beasts,' he said after a while, "'but we've left a sign for men to read.' They won't follow our trail very easily, and until they find that symbol, they won't know for sure we've turned south. Even then it won't be easy to smell us out without the beasts to aid them. But the woods south of the trail will be full of warriors looking for us. If we keep moving after daylight, we'll be sure to run into some of them. As soon as we can find a good place, we'll hide and wait until another night to swing back and make the river. We've got to warn Volanus, but it won't help him any if we get ourselves killed. Warn Volanus? Hell, the woods along the river are swarming with picks. That's why they got us. 
Zogar's brewing war magic. No mere raid this time. He's done something no Pict has done in my memory. United as many as fifteen or sixteen clans. His magic did it. They'll follow a wizard farther than they will a war chief. You saw the mob in the village, and there were hundreds hiding along the river bank that you didn't see. More coming from the farther villages. He'll have at least three thousand fighting men. I lay in the bushes and heard their talk as they went past. They mean to attack the fort. When, I don't know. But Zogar doesn't dare delay long. He's gathered them and whipped them into a frenzy. If he doesn't lead them into battle quickly, they'll fall to quarreling with one another. They're like blood-mad tigers. I don't know whether they can take the fort or not. Anyway, we've got to get back across the river and give the warning. The settlers on the Velitrium Road must either get into the fort or back to Velitrium. While the Picts are besieging the fort, war parties will range the road far to the east, might even cross Thunder River and raid the thickly settled country behind Velitrium. As he talked, he was leading the way deeper and deeper into the ancient wilderness. Presently he grunted with satisfaction. They had reached a spot where the underbrush was more scattered, and an outcropping of stone was visible, wandering off southward. Balthus felt more secure as they followed it. Not even a Pict could trail them over naked rock. "'How did you get away?' he asked presently. Conan tapped his mail shirt and helmet. "'If more boarders would wear harnesses, they'd be fewer skulls hanging on the altar huts. But most men make noise if they wear armor. They were waiting on each side of the path without moving, and when a Pict stands motionless, the very beasts of the forest pass him without seeing him. They'd seen us crossing the river, and got in their places. If they'd gone into ambush after we left the bank, I'd have had some hint of it. But they were waiting, and not even a leaf trembled. The devil himself couldn't have suspected anything. The first suspicion I had was when I heard a shaft rasp against a bow as it was pulled back. I dropped and yelled for the men behind me to drop, but they were too slow, taken by surprise like that. Most of them fell at the first volley that raked us from both sides. Some of the arrows crossed the trail and struck picks on the other side. I heard them howl. He grinned with vicious satisfaction. Such of us as were left plunged into the woods and closed with him. When I saw the others were all down or taken, I broke through and outfooted the painted devils through the darkness. They were all around me. I ran and crawled and sneaked, and sometimes I lay on my belly under the bushes while they passed me on all sides. I tried for the shore and found it lined with them, waiting for just such a move. But I'd have cut my way through and taken a chance on swimming. Only I heard the drums pounding in the village and knew they'd taken somebody alive. They were all so engrossed in Zogar's magic that I was able to climb the wall behind the altar hut. There was a warrior supposed to be watching at that point, but he was squatting behind the hut and peering around the corner at the ceremony. I came up behind him and broke his neck with my hands before he knew what was happening. It was his spear I threw into the snake, and that's his axe you're carrying. But what was that, that thing you killed at the altar hut? asked Balthus, with a shiver at the memory of the dim seen horror. One of Zogar's gods. One of Jabal's children that didn't remember and had to be kept chained to the altar. A bull ape. The Picts think they're sacred to the hairy one who lives on the moon, the gorilla god of Gula. It's getting light. Here's a good place to hide until we see how close they're on our trail. Probably have to wait until night to break back to the river. A low hill pitched upward, girdled and covered with thick trees and bushes. Near the crest, Conan slid into a tangle of jutting rocks crowned by dense bushes. Lying among them, they could see the jungle below without being seen. It was a good place to hide or defend. 
Balthus did not believe that even a Pict could have trailed them over the rocky ground for the past four or five miles, but he was afraid of the beasts that obeyed Zogar Sag. His faith in the curious symbol wavered a little now, but Conan had dismissed the possibility of beasts tracking them. A ghostly whiteness spread through the dense branches. The patches of sky visible altered in hue, grew from pink to blue. Balthus felt the gnawing of hunger, though he had slaked his thirst at a stream they had skirted. There was complete silence, except for an occasional chirp of a bird. The drums were no longer to be heard. Balthus's thoughts reverted to the grim scene before the altar hut. Those were ostrich plumes Zogar Sag wore, he said. I've seen them on the helmets of knights who rode from the east to visit the barons of the marches. There are no ostriches in this forest, are there? They came from Cush, answered Conan. West of here, many marches, lies the seashore. Ships from Singara occasionally come and trade weapons and ornaments and wine to the coastal tribes for skins and copper ore and gold dust. Sometimes they trade ostrich plumes they got from the Stygians, who in turn got them from the black tribes of Cush, which lies south of Stygia. The Pictish shamans place great store by them, but there's much risk in such trade. The Picts are too likely to try to seize the ship, and the coast is dangerous to ships. I've sailed along it when I was with the pirates of the Barakan Isles, which lie southwest of Zingara. Balthus looked at his companion with admiration. I knew you hadn't spent your life on this frontier. You've mentioned several far places. You've traveled widely. I've roamed far, farther than any other man of my race ever wandered. I've seen all the great cities of the Hyborians, the Shemites, the Stygians, and the Hyrcanians. I've roamed in the unknown country south of the Black Kingdoms of Cush and east of the Sea of Bilayet. I've been a mercenary captain, a corsair, a cossack, a penniless vagabond, a general. Hell, I've been everything except a king, and I may be that before I die. The fancy pleased him, and he grinned hardly. Then he shrugged his shoulders and stretched his mighty figure on the rocks. This is as good life as any. I don't know how long I'll stay on the frontier. A week, a month, a year. I have a roving foot, but it's as well on the border as anywhere. Balthus set himself to watch the forest below them. Momentarily he expected to see fierce painted faces thrust through the leaves, but as the hours passed no stealthy footfall disturbed the brooding quiet. Balthus believed the Picts had missed their trail and given up the chase. Conan grew restless. We should have sighted parties scouring the woods for us. If they've quit the chase, it's because they're after bigger game. They may be gathering to cross the river and storm the fort. Would they come this far south if they lost the trail? They've lost the trail, all right. Otherwise, they'd have been on our necks before now. Under ordinary circumstances, they'd scour the woods for miles in every direction. Some of them should have passed within sight of this hill. They must be preparing to cross the river. We've got to take a chance and make for the river. Creeping down the rocks, Balthus felt his flesh crawl between his shoulders as he momentarily expected a withering blast of arrows from the green masses about them. He feared that the Picts had discovered them and were lying about in ambush. But Conan was convinced no enemies were near, and the Cimmerian was right. "'We're miles to the south of the village,' grunted Conan. We'll hit straight through for the river. I don't know how far down the river they've spread. We'll hope to hit it below them. With haste that seemed reckless to Balthus, they hurried eastward. The woods seemed empty of life. Conan believed that all the Picts were gathered in the vicinity of Guawila, if indeed they had not already crossed the river. He did not believe they would cross in the daytime, however. Some woodsmen would be sure to see them and give the alarm. They'll cross above and below the fort, out of sight of the sentries. Then others will get in canoes and make straight across for the river wall. As soon as they attack, those hidden in the woods on the east shore will assail the fort from the other sides. 
They've tried that before and got the guts shot and hacked out of them. But this time they've got enough men to make a real onslaught of it. They pushed on without pausing, though Balthus gazed longingly at the squirrels flitting among the branches, which he would have brought down with a cast of his axe. With a sigh he drew up his broad belt. The everlasting silence and gloom of the primitive forest was beginning to depress him. He found himself thinking of the open groves and sun-dappled meadows of the Turan, of the bluff cheer of his father's steep-thatched, diamond-paned house, of the fat cows browsing through the deep, lush grass, and the hearty fellowship of the brawny, bare-armed plowmen and herdsmen. He felt lonely in spite of his companion. Conan was as much a part of this wilderness as Balthus was alien to it. The Cimmerian might have spent years among the great cities of the world, he might have walked with the rulers of civilization, he might even achieve his wild whim some day and rule as king of a civilized nation. Stranger things had happened. But he was no less a barbarian. He was concerned only with the naked fundamentals of life, the warm intimacies of small, kindly things, the sentiments and delicious trivialities that make up so much of civilized men's lives were meaningless to him. A wolf was no less a wolf because a whim of chance caused him to run with the watchdogs. Bloodshed and violence and savagery were the natural elements of the life Conan knew. He could not and would never understand the little things that are so dear to civilized men and women. The shadows were lengthening when they reached the river and peered through the masking bushes. They could see up and down the river for about a mile each way. The sullen stream lay bare and empty. Conan scowled across at the other shore. We've got to take another chance here. We've got to swim the river. We don't know whether they've crossed or not. The woods over there may be alive with them. We've got to risk it. We're about six miles south of Guahuila. He wheeled and ducked as a bowstring twanged. Something like a white flash of light streaked through the bushes. Balthus knew it was an arrow. Then with a tigerish bound Conan was through the bushes. Balthus caught the gleam of steel as he whirled his sword and heard a death scream. The next instant he had broken through the bushes after the Cimmerian. A picked with a shattered skull lay face down on the ground, his fingers spasmodically clawing at the grass. Half a dozen others were swarming about Conan, swords and axes lifted. They had cast away their bows, useless at such deadly close quarters. Their lower jaws were painted white, contrasting vividly with their dark faces and the designs on their muscular breasts differed from any Balthus had ever seen. One of them hurled his axe at Balthus and rushed after it with lifted knife. Balthus ducked and then caught the wrist that drove the knife licking at his throat. They went to the ground together, rolling over and over. The Pict was like a wild beast, his muscles hard as steel strings. Balthus was striving to maintain his hold on the wild man's wrists and bring his own axe into play, but so fast and furious was the struggle that each attempt to strike was blocked. The Pict was wrenching furiously to free his knife hand, was clutching at Balthus's axe and driving his knees at the youth's groin. Suddenly he attempted to shift his knife to his free hand, and in that instant Balthus, struggling up on one knee, split the painted head with a desperate blow of his axe. He sprang up and glared wildly about for his companion, expecting to see him overwhelmed by numbers. Then he realized the full strength and ferocity of the Cimmerian. Conan bestrode two of his attackers, shorn half asunder by that terrible broadsword. As Balthus looked, he saw the Cimmerian beat down a thrusting short-sword, avoid the stroke of an axe with a cat-like sidewise spring which brought him within arm's length of a squat savage stooping for a bow. Before the Pict could straighten, 
the red sword flailed down and clove him from shoulder to mid-breastbone, where the blade stuck. The remaining warriors rushed in, one from either side. Balthus hurled his axe with an accuracy that reduced the attackers to one, and Conan, abandoning his efforts to free his sword, wheeled and met the remaining picked with his bare hands. The stocky warrior, a head shorter than his tall enemy, leaped in, striking with his axe, at the same time stabbing murderously with his knife. The knife broke on the Cimmerian's mail, and the axe checked in mid-air as Conan's fingers locked like iron on the descending arm. A bone snapped loudly, and Balthus saw the picked wince and falter. The next instant he was swept off his feet, lifted high above the Cimmerian's head. He writhed in mid-air for an instant, kicking and thrashing, and then was dashed headlong to the earth with such force that he rebounded and then lay still, his limp posture telling of splintered limbs and a broken spine. Come on! Conan wrenched his sword free and snatched up an axe. Grab a bow and a handful of arrows, and hurry. We've got to trust to our heels again. That yell was heard. They'll be here in no time. If we tried to swim now, they'd feather us with arrows before we reached midstream. End of chapter 5